surround yourself with people who are where you want to be. And when you do that, you realize usually there's nothing super special about them. They're not geniuses. They're not anything out of the ordinary. They're just people who dedicate their time a certain way and they do it consistently. Welcome back to the Agents Who Crush It in Real Estate. I'm your host, Lindsay Favaza. And today we have an incredible guest who's making waves in the real estate industry. Salah Amrani, a young and dynamic realtor, has built a successful business from the ground up, and he's done it through sheer determination. Salah is known for his exceptional skills in cold calling, a sales tool that many shy away from, but he's turned it into an art form. At a young age, he's already achieved what many in the industry strive for, and today he's here to share his journey, strategies, and insights with you. Welcome to the podcast today. It's, it's a pleasure to be on, and I thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful intro. It's so awkward to listen to someone right there just talking about you. So I get it. It's an awkward thing, but you deserve some blushing. You deserve an you deserve all the blushing because you have had quite the career so far, my friend, and I'm sure huge things to come. So let's dive into your background. And I was joking with you before we actually started recording that like your background is you were so young. So it's like, what background did you even have before you got in? So take us back. When did you first decide that you were going to go into real estate? What did that path look like for you? Yeah, for sure. So most of my adult life, I've been I've been a real estate agent. So I turned I became a real estate agent right after high school. I was 18 years old. I graduated high school June of 2017, and I got my license October 2017. And I was you know right after I graduated, I was working you know my fast food jobs. Yeah, I had two or three jobs at once. I knew I wasn't going to go to college. Um, so I just wanted to work, save money, and just kind of figure it out as I go. So I was just filling my day with with work hours. Yeah. And I got my license because at one of my jobs, this guy came by. I was working drive through and he was a successful real estate agent, drove a cool car. I was like, hey, like at the time I didn't know. I, I just asked, I saw the cool car. I said, what do you do for a living? Yeah. And he said, I'm, I'm a realtor. I was like, oh, like what is that? Like, what, what, what is a realtor? What do realtors do? And he explained it to me. And then he said, you know, you, you're, you seem like a personable person. You should, you should get a real estate license. And literally right as he drove off, I took my phone and I Googled real estate school near me. And there you was one, I'm from Haven. Real estate. Yep. <laughs> yep. Real it was uh, one in downtown Haverhill and literally five minutes away from my work. So I got out of my shift that day, signed up for real estate school. I love that. And why is it that you, you know, felt that college wasn't for you? Because I feel like in this day and age, it feels like that's the only path for kids after high school. It's like you're either going to college or like you're not right. Like it, there's this like stigma that you have to go to college. So I love the fact. And personally, I think that it's the way that we should all go is like figuring out the right path for you, not necessarily fitting into some kind of box. So why was that not the right fit for you? What was your thought process there? Yeah, for sure. So for me, I um, I was in a position where I felt like I needed to like contribute at a quickly and, and at a young age. So, you know, going and, and not making money while being in college and, and taking on debt and, and going to school with a lot of uncertainty. Like I didn't know for sure what I would want to do. And there was a lot of figuring out and a lot of money being spent without getting anything back in that meantime, that didn't seem like the right path. You know, I, I grew up single mom background, um, worked a lot as she worked all the time. And so I saw that mm -hmm. firsthand. So in my mind, I was like, as soon as I can contribute, take care of my own stuff and, and help with, with her as well. That, that was what my focus was and what was going to make me happy. So filling the hours at that time seemed like the short term solution. And then, you know, kind of trusting that as time went on can figure out what's next. And in a but sense, like, even though I didn't have school looming over your head. Right. Exactly. Smart. Yeah. And in a sense, it, it kind of panned out that way. I mean, the, the out of real estate work, like prior real estate work experience didn't, I did, didn't have to happen for a long time. And then real estate just kind of, came into fruition. So that was my thought process. It was just, I want to do something now rather than go to college, hope to figure it out and then have a pile of debt afterwards. So do you know who this realtor is? Are you still in contact with this person? Cause I feel like he was oh, yeah. a little bit of that. Like, 
I feel like I'm a strong believer in the fact that people are plopped into your life at certain moments for certain reasons. And I feel like that was definitely a moment. <laughs> I definitely think it was divine timing. I do still know him. He's still a real estate agent That's and cool. um, really nice guy. Uh, I, you know, when I first got in, I think, you know, he wanted me to join his team, which is normal, you know, with, yeah. with in real estate. I didn't go that path, but we, we have a good, good relationship still. That's amazing. I love that. And he's supportive and excited for you because he saw that in you. And like I said, obviously he definitely saw the right thing because the fact that you literally did it within seconds, it's, it's a testament to why you've been successful. So take yeah. us back to those early days. So you get your license, you know, you get started in real estate. What are those early days like for you? What are you doing? Kind of, what are you doing to try to figure it out? Yeah. So I get my real estate license. It took me six tries, I think, to pass my real estate test. Yep. And That's how I'm it still is. working my, yep. I'm still working my, I, I worked at Dunkin' Donuts. That was my, that was my yep. job. I was holding until I, I, I got it figured out. So I'm, I'm filling my test every time, rescheduling every week. I finally pass. I go to my Keller Williams brokerage, which I'm still at today. I interview the team leader there once I get my license. And, I was like, hey, what do I need to do to like sell a house today? Like, I just want to, I want to sell a house immediately. And they were like, well, you need to do some classes, so on and so forth, learn the forms and all of that. And I was like, great. I signed on with them. I did the classes I was supposed to do, you know, learning how to fill out contracts, how to navigate through the process. And once I had that, I was like, okay, great. I know what to do. Like, where do I, where do I get a yeah. deal? Like, how do I get a listing? How do I get a buyer? Like, and I just, just kind of looked at him. everyone. <laughs> Right. And I looked at everyone in the office and they all did different things. Like some of them did open houses every weekend. Some of them put all their focus into social media and, and getting buyers through that or uh, clients through that. And there was this one guy who was a cold calling machine. He would go into the office every morning at 9 a.m. He would make cold calls from 9 to 12 in the afternoon. And then around 1230 to three o'clock, he'd go on appointments. And if he had more appointments, you know, it'd be out longer than three. If he didn't have any more appointments, come back into the office and put listings, maybe make some more calls. Like that was just his every single day routine. And I was like, I like that. I like what he's doing. It all is like very systematic and, and makes sense to me. Um, so he was very gracious and was like, Hey, if you want to learn how to call, come sit in my office, listen to me call look at how I run my day. And if you think it's for you, then do that too. And I did exactly that. Like I, you know, my first few months as an agent, literally I would go into the office every day, call all day. I most times didn't have appointments, right? I didn't get appointments immediately. So I just mm -hmm. keep calling, keep calling from nine to four to five to six, whatever it was. And then finally someone says, yep, come to my house. Tell me what you think it's worth. What would you, what you would do? And you know, through that, just kind of built the pipeline of people telling me come to an appointment, getting something signed, doing it again and again and again. So my first yeah. year doing that kind of religiously, I ended with 27 listings total. And like, um, the, um, and like at the time, like I didn't see it as something like, obviously like I was happy with what was happening, but I didn't see it as anything like kind of amazing until, you know, the other agents around you are like, wow, like how is that happening? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm just calling the people that are available to call, you know. So and, where were you getting these lists from, I guess? And like, what what kind of lists were these? And then on top of that, um, what was it? What was your general message? You don't have to do your script, but like, what was your general message that you were giving to them? Was it all about like, hey, are you looking for a home value? Or were you kind of more of like a general, like, are you looking to buy or sell? You know, what was your what was your message? Yeah. So I, I, the, the people I was calling, I learned that they were considered the low hanging fruit and, and, and for real estate agents. So for sale by owners and expired listings, both people who have like indicated, Hey, I want to sell my house. Yeah. Um, so those were who I was contacting, but for sale by owners, I just got them for free on Zillow. If you go on Zillow, there's the list there for free. People there trying is. to sell the house. <laughs> yeah. Expired. I, it's the one service that I ever paid for as an agent and still pay for it to this day, Red X, where you get all the expired listings straight from the yeah. MLS, phone numbers, names, and whatnot. So that's who I called. And, you know, for the FISBO script, it was always, you know, how long are you going to try to sell your house until you consider interviewing an agent? Yeah. 
yeah. then the expireds is, hey, I saw you had it on the market. It didn't sell. When do you plan on putting it back on and selling again? Yeah. And, you know, the conversations unfold in a bunch of different ways based on people's circumstances. But that was literally it. It was that those calls over and over and over again throughout the days. So I have two questions. My first one, yeah. and you can answer it, and then we'll get to my second one. My first one is, how do you warm someone up when it's a cold phone call and you literally have like this much time to really get them to stay on the phone with you? Because I mean, most people are probably hanging up within the first, if they answer at all, they're hanging up within the first couple seconds, right? So how do you, what's your tactic or strategy to get them to like stay on and hear what you have to say? Yeah. So my, my early on, I learned scripts and I got scripts of like what you're supposed to say. And at first, like when you're just reading a piece of paper, you don't really get how someone else is interpreting it. You're just reading something saying, okay, this is what I'm supposed to say. But when you really think about it, some like somebody's answering the phone, what do they want to know? Like it's a number, you don't know who this person is. Someone's calling you answer it. Why are you calling me? So it's kind of quick of, Hey, I'm so-and-so and I'm calling because of this. Yep. And then, you know, if they usually when someone's planning to sell their house, it's a pretty big thing and it's taken up a lot of mind space already. So if you quickly tell them, I'm calling, I'm this is who I am, I'm calling because of this reason, they'll hear you out because it's something that they're thinking about selling their house. Uh, yeah. I saw you have it on or you had it on and it's no longer. I'm calling about you talking about you selling it in the future or me helping you sell it. And you know, letting them do most of the talking of here's what happened or here's what I plan and then answering that accordingly. Get them talking for sure. Correct. And making sure like the, they understand clearly I, this is who I am. This is why I'm calling it. So like, uh, yeah, so there's no way to talk about But this. at the same time, they kind of open up and then you and then you got them talking. Now they're not going to now they feel more invested in that phone call. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. So my second question when it comes to all this is. You know, you call 100 people, you might get one. How do you, how would you say to some other person that's maybe listening today, a realtor that's like, oh my God, cold calling is so scary. It stresses me out. I, it's like, it like really hurts their like ego to hear no so many times. So do you have a strategy behind like kind of keeping yourself like, okay, do, don't worry about the no's? Like what's your, how do you kind of keep yourself from feeling defeated, I guess? You know what it is? I think it's knowing that when you see that somebody else has built a good business doing it, it should give you the belief that you can too, right? Like early, like I would call, like when I was brand new, three weeks, a month straight, every single day I'm calling and I get nowhere with it. But because I saw this other agent in my office do it all the time and he sometimes has the same issue, but he still keeps doing it. And then at the end of the year, he can look back and say, because I made all those calls, I had a great year. It made me say, I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm going to, I'm going to truck through those no's until I get a yes. So you really need to believe that it's going to work while you're doing it, work on your skills, see where you're struggling, see what you can get, you know, where you need to practice more and just trust consistency will, will, will bring you to where you want to be. But, you know, having him and seeing that it worked for him and then over time seeing other people who have built the business around just cold calling said if, if they can do it then there should be no reason that i can't either right i love that and now someone that's listening today knows that you do it so even if they don't have that person that they look up to in their office or something that's doing it that way because there's not many people that do this strategy there's really not there's like yeah. so many people that are afraid of picking up the phone, number one, and, you know, just doing this kind of strategy. They just I think a lot of agents just hope that, like, people will just gravitate to them. Um, and that's a hard that's a hard and a much longer game. It's possible, but it's harder for sure. Right. Definitely. I think um, I think if even if someone doesn't make it their number one thing, it's a great thing to add to your buckets of lead gen right? Like if you're doing open houses all the time consistently and you're, you know, farming consistently and you just throw cold calling into the mix on a consistent basis, you'll see a return from it if you're doing it often. So what do you think the, the volume is that would make someone successful? Because someone might say, listening to what you just said, they might say, well, yeah, I call like five to 10 people a week. Well, they're probably not going to be successful then, right? Like, or do you look at it more as like, you need to have a list that you call 
this many times, right? Or like, how do you kind of, what to you would be like a don't bother measurement, right? Or like, a, yeah. you need, this is what you should set it up to see that success. Yeah, it's almost, and I think having something set in stone where if you, if you tell somebody, hey, make this amount of calls throughout this week and, and, and then go from there, it could set up for a good thing or a bad thing. Because you almost have to, it has to be a trial and error. Like you need to start somewhere, see how it goes. If you called 50 people one week and you didn't get anything, maybe next week try more. Or if you got 50, if you called 50 and you got something out of it, then use that as your foundation saying going forward, it's going to be 50 people a week. Um, yeah. And because of that, I'll get one or two. But it's it's really trial and error depending on where you are, how many expireds you have in your market, how many FISBOs you have in your market. Um, but starting somewhere and not giving up after the first week or first month. Like if, if nothing happened, now you know if it was 50 and nothing came out of it, maybe up it to 75 or, or 85 or whatever it is. But just keep doing it. Give it a good three, four months before you give up on it. I mean, that really is like the key to a lot of success in real estate is that the people that are successful, they haven't given up. They've tried things that are new, but then they stick with it and see it out. I can't tell you how many people come to me and talk to me about, oh, do, do postcards really work? Yeah, they do. You just have to do them. <laughs> you have to do them consistently, right? You can't send one out, not hear anything, and then say that they don't work. Then, yes, they're not going to work because you're not sending them. Um, so it's just like exactly. that. With so as far as like all your other channels then, right? So like is cold calling and doing these kind of tactics, is this – like the one thing that you do, I'm assuming you don't and that you have other things in your mix. So what else works for you? Yeah. I mean, so a cold calling, like the hardcore cold calling, like I did that for the first three to four years. And then through that, I picked up investor clients, you know, people who are for sale by owners, but they were fl home flippers who were trying to mm -hmm. save on commission. So they went for sale by owner, met them, built a relationship with them, help them sell that house. And then onward, one of, you know, I have one investor client in particular for the last three years, each year he's done 12 deals just by himself, just buying the house and then helping them sell it. Um, I've, you know, built the uh, database of people who now send me referrals from those cold calls. So a lot of my business now is repeat investors, um, referrals. So cold calling is still in the mix, but that allowed me to open up other buckets that I wasn't even expecting to open up, you know, mm -hmm. with those other, other sources. So uh, the, that started the cold calling helped me get to the buckets that I have now of like the investors, the repeats and the referrals. What other things do you do? I know you're very active on social. Um, you That's one thing that I, I need to like add that. more to, and yeah. I'm, I'm excited to add more to as time goes on. I've been, you know, I'm, I'm 25. I'm under the age uh, I'm obviously under, under 30, but I've sold probably over 160 homes from when I started to now. And there's not a lot of agents in a, in like under the age of 30 or whatever it could be in our market that have sold that many, but yeah. I on social, I'm very quiet about it. Like I don't, I don't post much as, as much as I should. So going forward, that's something I have a lot of focus on, on adding to on the tool belt. I love that. But obviously you've done it without it, right? So the now doing it is just bonus. It's icing on the cake, right? So um, that's really impressive. And, you know, like you had said, I think most agents that are around your age group, that is like one of their sole focuses, you know, and that's a longer game. I mean, it's right. a great strategy, but it's a longer strategy. So, for and sure. if you don't have deals, then that strategy doesn't really that even work because you have nothing to show for content or anything like that. So I think the way you did it is really smart. So um, what would you say is kind of a non-negotiable for you in during like, let's say a month, right? As far as like the things that you do within your schedule or things that you make sure that you don't miss out doing. So you can't go, if you want to be in the business, you need to talk to a buyer and seller every day. So if you go a month and you're not doing any sort of lead gen, um, adding to your database, adding to your pipeline, then you can't expect to have a consistent, successful real estate business. So for me, every day that goes by, if I go a full day and not talk to anybody, I kind of sit there and I'm like, talk to anybody new, I'm sorry. 
I sit there, I'm like, this is a bad sign for what can come in the future. This is this is what causes the real estate agent roller coaster of up yeah. months and down months is the inconsistently inconsistency of talking to people on yeah. a daily basis. We call it in our company closing mode. So this time of year is notorious for agents kind of slowing down um, because they push, you know, they they feel the burn of like the summer months. And then they pull off the gas because they're like, oh, it's been so busy. Like, I just need a minute. Right. And then right. what ends up happening is they start the following year way slower than they expected because that is your you have to keep that hamster wheel turning. Right. So it's it's closing mode, but it's also, you know, just making sure you're doing all those tasks. So I love that. So what other things um, do you focus on? What other things are you know paramount to you? Maybe it's like some kind of time management that you do for yourself or maybe like you're super active going to the gym because you want to keep your mind sharp and your body sharp. Like what are those other things that are super important to you? Yeah. So I definitely try to keep it balanced as far as it's a stressful business and it, it takes a lot out of you and, and you got to put a lot of energy and effort, effort into it. will be 50 in no time in this business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, what helps me deal with it? Like I need to have time where I'm unplugged. Like I, I personally, I love playing basketball. I've, I've, I've been a hooper for, for quite a while. So having at least one or two days a week where I just completely not thinking about anything, hanging out with my friends, playing some basketball, you know, that helps me a lot, you know, just to kind of recoup energy and whatnot. Um, spend a time with family and all that, just getting away from it sometimes. Cause when you're in it, you want to put your all, all your focus, all your energy needs to be on what you're doing, your clients, your prospecting, you're, you're organizing of what's going to happen. And then when you're not doing that and you're taking time to yourself, you also really want to put your focus on that too. I, that's how I've looked at it and, and helped me kind of want to keep doing it after seven years. Yeah, I love that. So we're going to shift gears and I'm going to ask you to tell me the craziest real estate story that you have. Something bizarre, something crazy, something wild that happened to you in your real estate days there's a lot but i will <laughs> tell you i'll tell you a funny one yeah and this is when i was brand spanking new as an agent i got my first listing ever and it had a, it was a single family home on and it had a septic tank i grew up in haverhill in the city and we don't have a lot of septic tanks in the city it's public water public sewer i get this listing and somehow throughout the process of getting this listing I didn't, I didn't think to ask or know that it was on a septic, but I got the, the houses on the market. I'm doing an open house. Buyer comes through to the open house and he says, can you show me where the septic tank is? And I not knowing the functions of a home very well or, or the systems of a home and, but didn't want to show that I didn't know. Did I just said, sure, sure, I, yeah. <laughs> I could definitely show you that we're on the second floor of the home. And I'm like, follow me. We walk down the stairs get to the point where looks like we're going outside but we're not i take the door to the basement take my take these prospective buyers down to the basement point at some machine in the basement and i say i think that's the septic right there and by both buyers you know husband and wife kind of just look at me they have a piece of paper in their hand they cover their mouth to laugh a little bit and they're like oh <laughs> like no, that's that's not the septic. That can't be the septic tank. Septic tanks are going to be outside. That's the furnace. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of look back at them and say, like, "Oh, then I don't know where the septic is." <laughs> and uh, it was just. I crazy. love I love this story for many reasons, and I love it because it shows you have such a confidence about you, and I love that because. Most people, when they answer this question, they tell a story of like, there was this crazy seller and they look to other people. This one was, you're like, I'm going to tell you how I screwed up and oh. was embarrassing myself and you have no Fs given about it. And I freaking love that. No, it was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, now today I can tell you every system there is to know. You, and that was a, that was a wake up call to get educated on all the things. <laughs> I remember I, after that, after that it happened and I felt embarrassed throughout the whole open house and whatever I called my, um, I called, I called someone from my office of, of, of someone I was friendly with. And I was like, here's what happened to me and blah, blah, blah. And they just cracked up laughing. And everyone I told the story to thought it was the funniest thing. Um, 
so yeah, that was that was early you on. Yourself, you know, going forward after that, I knew to make sure what what everything was and where it was located immediately. Yeah, and what it looked like, and yeah, so now making that mistake again. I love that. That's so funny. So yeah. I cannot believe we're at twenty five minutes, but we are. That's what usually no happens when we have an awesome guest like you. So my last question to you is. If someone is sitting here listening today, I, I doubt we have anyone that's 18 about to leave call it. I mean, about to leave high school, wondering what they should do with their life listening. They're probably already in real estate, but let's say we have someone in real estate who's fairly new and they really want to kind of, you know, jumpstart their career, make it a full-time gig. You know, they're still doing that part-time. They're still doing their Dunkin' Donuts. You know what I mean? And they want to really get in and do something full-time um, in real estate. And that's their dream. What advice do you give to that person? I would say, you know, one, surround yourself with people who are where you want to be. And when you do that, you realize usually there's nothing super special about them. They're not geniuses. They're not anything out of the ordinary. They're just people who dedicate their time a certain way and they do it consistently. So when you can get around them, copy what they do, make it so that it fits you and, and, and your personality and how you want your business to be and do it. Because I think a lot of um, the struggle when, when, whether you're new or you're experienced and you want to get to a certain level is believing that you can. And I think the best way to get yourself to believe that you can is see someone else who's done it, realizing that they just do certain things that get them there and you can do those same things too. Um, but be, be, be dedicated, be persistent, um, persevere through it. And, and there's nothing in this industry that one can't do. Yeah. I love that. Sala, thank you so, so much. This was absolutely awesome. I want you all to go and follow. I always don't know where to point. There we go. Yep. We're going to go nice. right here and you're going to follow him on Facebook, follow him on Instagram, go and ask him questions. You're such an open book. And I loved, I loved all the actionable tips that you had today. This was such a great episode. So thank you so much for sharing with us. I really, really appreciate I, it. I, my pleasure. And I, I, I'm glad to be on. And this was a very cool episode, I must say. Yeah, it was. It definitely was. So keep an eye out for Sala's episode, obviously, if you're seeing it on YouTube, um, but definitely go and listen to the podcast as well. Thank you all so much for listening or watching today. And we'll see you guys on the next episode of the Agents Who Crush It in Real Estate. Thanks so much, Sala. Thanks, guys. Thank you for tuning in to the Agents Who Crush It in Real Estate podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it with your friends and colleagues and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. If you're interested in being a guest, email us at info at crushitinre.com. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to crush it in real estate.